Hello. Okay. Oh, sorry. I forgot to tell you. I'm ready to start. All right. Thank you all for being here. Isn't this exciting? This is the opening session of Ag Day at COP27 in Egypt. And I am so pleased. I'm Karen Ross, and I'm secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And I just have a passion for what we're going to be talking about today because it's about farmers at the center of feeling the impacts of climate change, but also farmers leading on solutions on the land to climate change. And we're going to have a discussion here with our panelists that really do represent global agriculture, either farmers themselves or people who work directly with farmers on a daily basis, providing technical assistance and expertise on how do we adapt and mitigate climate change. One of the things we all know, for those of us who are in farming and work with farmers, is that everything on the farm is complex, it's interconnected, and it's constantly changing. There's huge risks. We used to call it weather, but now we feel the impacts. In our state, we're in the midst of a historical drought where we do not have the water that we rely upon to grow crops. And it's hard to be in agriculture if you're not getting rain, precipitation, or you have opportunities to carefully use and steward groundwater to be able to grow crops. That's one of the most evident ways that we feel climate change in California. We also have very complex farming systems because we're a big state. We can grow just about anything all year round, but with 400 crops, you can imagine the diversity that we're dealing with and the microclimates that we're dealing with. So I'm pleased today to be able to moderate this panel, to really hear about what the opportunities are, each one of our farming systems in a way that will really help convey the diversity and the importance of flexibility and adaptation, and to be able to better understand the critical need for ongoing research, science to give us new technologies and innovation, the investment that this will require, and the one thing I always ask for is the patience. Things on the farm, some things happen rapidly, usually on the negative side, um, but to, to see the opportunities over time is what's really going to make the difference for farmers leading on solutions to climate. So with me today, I have a farmer from Egypt, our host country, very pleased to have you here. I'm going to ask each one of you as I introduce you to please just give us a five to six minute introduction to your farm or the farming system and the farmers that you work with and what you are observing, impacts of climate change, how you're adapting, and what is on your wish list for solutions as you lead on solutions on the land. Now, I've got to get out my list because I just met these wonderful people this morning, except for Fred. Disclaimer, I've known Fred a very long time, but many people have known Fred a very long time. Um, our farmer from Egypt is Hilme Abulish. Did I say that correctly or close enough? I know, I'm really bad. I'm, a, I'm originally from Nebraska, so all my friends from Iowa say they have to talk slower to us to get it right. But it's really nice to have you here hosting us today. We also have a guest from India that I will introduce after I introduce Betty from Mal Malawi. Yeah, I almost forgot where you're from. I'm sorry, how could I forget that? Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and to share with you uh, a fairy tale from Egypt. 45 years ago, my father decided that he wants to 
use organic farming to reclaim deserts and um, process organic products for the Egyptian market. And uh, beside this, focus on human development, building schools and all kind of things. So obviously, everyone told him this is a no-go, will never happen, mission impossible, 45 years ago, 1977. And uh, today I'm sitting here because a miracle unfolded over these 45 years and today there are thousands of farmers who work organically in Egypt. We have our own farms, we have 2,000 people processing organic products sold mainly in the local market. We have schools for 800 kids and a university for sustainable development with 3,000 students. So this is the quick uh, fairy tale. Now what is this in regard to the question of today? What we found out just uh, three, four years ago, to be honest, um, that by caring for the soil, by working organically, and you can call it organic, regenerative, biodynamic, agroecology, I don't care, but whatever regenerative practice you apply, you work actively uh, uh, on the climate change challenge. And please let's not forget, huh? all this race to zero and, uh, and targets are only possible if the agricultural sector comes in. Because industry and we as people cannot go to zero <laughs> unless you make suicide and close the factories. So we need the other side. We need the agricultural sector and the forest side to balance whatever emissions will be there after all the reductions we can do. There is no way to go to zero without us. So having <laughs> said this, our sector in Egypt emits five tons of CO2 equivalent per year per acre as an average. And our organic farms sequester 10 to 20 tons in soil, trees, compost, and so on. Huge difference, eh? And so we said, okay, whereas we have this problem that the organic sector is not going mainstream because it looks expensive and people cannot afford, and all two cost accounting FAO reports and so on show that organic is cheaper if you consider the externalized costs, of course, but nobody cares. So we have to monetize some of these externalized costs. And we started to generate agricultural carbon credits for our bi organic and biodynamic farmers. And this is, this is the surprise, an additional income which is higher than their profit from their crop. So what we did the last two years is we worked with 2,000 farmers they now work organically. They sell at conventional price to their villages and cities around. They get an additional income which is 50% higher than what they had before. So better than the premium I was paying for Demeter raw materials. And they sequester 10 to 20 tons of, of carbon. What does this mean? It means that basically our farmers of Egypt could offset 50% of, of Egypt's overall emissions, provide organic food and so on. What does it need? It needs, obviously, a governance system to have agricultural carbon credits. It needs a market. Egypt announced the opening of a voluntary carbon market two days ago, and international uh, markets are growing. So I hope that we will be able to upscale next two years to 40,000 farmers, next two years to 250. Target 7 million farmers of Egypt are honored as climate heroes and have a better livelihood while they provide better food and uh, I hope very much that this example can spread all over the world because this is not Egypt related. Thank you. Okay, drop the mic, right? <laughs> uh, one of the questions I, I want you to think about, I want to learn more about your carbon credits because you're selling them on the market as opposed to keeping them within the food value chain and scope three emissions I think are going to drive some of the discussion in the United States so that's going to be really interesting to learn about. Betty Chiyuma Yuma, I know I just really mess up your last name and I apologize for that, but I'm so pleased to have you here because I know you work with farmers on a daily basis. Would you give us just a peek into your farming systems? Um, thank you very much. Um, I represent the National Smallholder Farmers Association of Malawi. It is the largest smallholder farmer association in Malawi, uh, representing over 100,000 um, registered smallholders, but working with about 300,000 smallholder farmers. So when we started talking about uh, climate change, when you know the world was just beginning to talk about climate change, 
obviously this is also a subject that we brought to our members, telling them that there's climate change and what the impacts are going to be and all that. But most of the farmers were quite dismissive. They're like, oh, okay, it's just science. We really don't have much to do with it. It didn't take very long for the farmers themselves to come back to us and start saying, the climate is changing. Things are not the way they used to be anymore. And this time, it wasn't really because of the floods and stuff, but just simple things like delays in when the rainfall was going to come. And these were traditional farmers who really depended on just the weather to know what to do. So when the rain started coming later than normal or the amounts, it really put them, started to make them panic. But it hasn't taken very long for now extreme weather to start hitting very hard. So now we have frequent occurrences of extreme weather. We've had cyclones, we've got uh, floods, we've got droughts. In some years, even a flooding and drought, um, interseason drought within the same year. And all those things are new and really making the farmers say that we need to do something about this. So it's not anymore a, a case of extension workers telling them, but it's more the farmers themselves saying, this is something that is happening. We need um, responses. We need to respond and we need assistance on how best to deal with these issues. So one of the technologies that we started promoting was uh, conservation agriculture. And I'll use it as an example in terms of maybe the things that we need to do better. So in terms of conservation agriculture, there were a set of principles that we were promoting. And it worked very well because during that period, uh, we were hit by droughts year in, year out. And one of the practices we're promoting was ground cover. So ground cover and droughts, they worked very well until a flood came. And the ground cover <laughs> and, and the flood didn't work very well. So all of a sudden, now the farmers came back and said, but we believed these technologies. But look, those who didn't do ground cover are actually now better off than us who were practicing ground cover. And that made us to realize that how are the messages being given out to the farmers? It's not one solution that works at all times and for everything. And there comes in the role of re continuous research and development and how the farmers are involved in that process. And I give it as one of the recommendations that this is something, it's not static. Things are constantly moving. The te context in which the farmers is changing. And therefore, it is important to con constantly involve the farmers in those contexts so that they can understand what practices, what innovations work under which environments. And secondly, the whole issue of harmonization of our messages. We have, in our space, there's so many NGOs, local and international NGOs, that come with specific messages or agenda. And it's just very important that there's harmonization because we are all talking to the same farmers. And when somebody comes and says this and the other person comes and says something else, it kind of confuses the farmers. But when we as stakeholders, the whole concept of much stakeholder approaching and harmonization of the messaging that we're giving to the farmers is actually um, very important. And lastly, um, it's, uh, it's financing and how we can use uh, complementary interventions uh, particularly in the case of Malawi, I would give the case of weather risk insurance as something that we found that has really helped because that helps with adoption because most of the farmers that we're working with are farmers that cannot afford to lose a harvest because if they lose a harvest, they've lost their entire livelihood. So when there's a weather risk insurance or, or crop insurance or such kind of things, then it makes them more willing to try out um, new technologies and not risk that if it fails and they lose everything. So I give those three as areas that I think uh, we need to build on and scale up in order to have smallholders increase the adoption of such technologies. Thank you. Betty, thank you. I think that's a great summary. And one of the things she's talked about here is on the messaging because we do have so many variables and so many challenges and yet the commonality is we are all on the land dealing with whatever the land and the environment present to us. 
So, Niels, before I go to you, I'd like to go to our guest from India, Chandrika Ben. Chandrika, are you with us? Yes. There she is. Good morning. Good morning. Namaste. Yes. We'd love to hear um, who you're representing today, your farming systems, and just give us a little snapshot into what you see as opportunities and where the needs are for farmers to lead on climate change. Thank you. Can't you hear me? Yes. The screen screen host to allow me to do some screen sharing. Go ahead. Chandrika, go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. If there's technical difficulties, no? Okay, all right. Trying to share screen, okay. I would like to share my screen. Go ahead. Can, can she work on that and we can go to Niels while we work on that? Oh, excellent. I just said the right word, should we move ahead? Go ahead, Chandrika, please. Namaste. Yes. I am Chandrika. I am a farmer as I have farming land in my parents and in-laws. We are five sisters and one brother. We had seven acre land, but it was on mortgage. Little hard to survive, so we all work. I am elder in my family. Me and my sister work hard do saving, and first we paid rupees 40,000 and then rupees 50,000 for the mortgage of our land. As a farmer daughter, I joined organization Atapi Seva Foundation, and since last 12 years, I am working with more than 5,000 farmers in 30 villages in my district with integrated approach centered on nature principle. We are small and marginal farmer, so we go cereals like wheat, millet, green gram, black gram for our own consumption. Some vegetables also grow in Kharif and winter season. Cotton and castor are grown for income purpose. We train our 3,100 farmer to build climate resilience, adoption of new technology, using certified seeds and micronutrients, and leading them to increase income. Along with this, build four women dairy cooperative of women farmer. It run by women only with latest technology, helping them to earn income. Till now, 50 farmers have made vermicompost unit and 1500 farmers have made compost pit for organic manual and also sell the access to earn income. 300 SSG have more than 1.5 crore saving with them for women's farmer. Addressing the need for water, recharging palm ponds and borewell in 22 villages has been done. 
ऑलमोस्ट थ्री थाउजेंड टू हंड्रेड फार्मर्स है यूजिंग स्मार्टफोन एंड लर्न न्यू टेक्नोलॉजी विथ हेल्प ऑफ देर चिल्ड्रन टिल नाउ फिफ्टी थाउजेंड हॉर्टिकल्चर प्लांटेस आर आर डन फार्मर्स आर नाउ ऑर्गेनाइज सो इट्स इम्पैक्ट ऑन देयर इनकम अर्लीयर दे आर अर्निंग प्रॉफिट अबाउट रुपीज फिफ्टीन टू सेवनटीन थाउजेंड पर एकर नाव दे आर अर्निंग प्रॉफिट ऑफ अराउंड थर्टी टू फोर्टी थाउजेंड बिकॉज दे आर डूइंग एग्रीकल्चर एनिमल हजबेंड्री एंड सेव मनी ऑन फर्टिलाइजर्स आई बिलीव देव नाट इज टाइम टू एक्ट एंड बिल्ड climate smart farmers all over the world and prioritize agriculture for food security and nutrition dhanyawad with this i would like to so short clip reflecting our work chandrika thank you i really thank you yes give her a round of applause really comprehensive approach with technical assistance notice the integrated farming systems to replace fertilizer um and so many small scale farmers in one area being able to come together on financing and improve their bottom line so thank you chandrika we're now going to move to denmark i want to welcome nils peter nering from denmark who's going to give us some insight to the great innovations and the ambitious goals for for all of ag and the whole country of denmark so nils take it away thank you very much and let me start with underlining that we are facing huge huge challenges in the future in the agriculture and in all society challenges as climate but also food for a growing population and there we have to have the farms to produce the right products in 2019 we decided in denmark the farmers in denmark decided that we want to have a vision we want to be climate neutral in 2050 and how do we do this first of all we have to produce more with less it's not a solution for the climate to stop producing it's a solution to produce the right products with less emissions we know some of the solutions but we don't know all of them so we have to have focus on finding new solutions in the future in denmark there's a big big pressure on the agriculture and we have a target from the government we have to reduce the agricultural emissions by 60% in 2030 compared with 1990 there's no quick fix we can the only quick fix is stopping producing and that's not what we're going to do the farmers in denmark we're gonna achieve we're gonna show that we are gonna reduce 60% in 2030 in the industry it's very easy you can shift from oil or gas from the fossil fuels to green energy but we cannot put electricity into the cow we cannot put electricity into the field we have to find the good solutions so let me talk about a little bit about the concrete solutions first of all in the milk production we have focus on feed additives and we have feed additives at the moment where we can reduce the emissions of methane by 30% we also look at the manure we have to bring the manure very fast from the stables to the biogas installations but we also have to look on the genetics we have to have some better cows producing more with less and also in the pig industry it's the same genetics but it takes a long long time before we have the new pigs so therefore we're looking at new stables new technology in the stables the manure should not stay in the stable it should be 
put out to the storage and as fast as possible be used as biogas. In the plant production, we are looking at new crop rotation systems. It's very, very important that we have the right systems where we have low emissions on the fields. We're looking at grass, much more grass than we have today. But we cannot use the grass immediately for human beings or the pigs or the chickens. So we upgrade it. So we take out the proteins by a process and we can now use it for feed and in the future also food. Uh, and in the plant production, there's also solutions, as I told. The last thing I want to say that we have some byproducts. We have the straw and we have the manure. Some of the manure and the straw can be used to biogas. But afterwards, we can in fact bring it to pyrolysis. When we do this, 50% of the CO2 can be stored in biochar, which will stay in the soil for hundreds of years. The another 50% of the CO2, which has been captured by the plants, that can be used for energy. And in fact, if we upgrade it, we can use it at jet fuel. So the next time you take the flight to the COP, it can perhaps be jet fuel used or produced from agricultural byproducts. And we have done a fantastic thing for the world because while we're producing this, we have captured and stored 50% of the CO2. So let's conclude. Agriculture is not a problem. Agriculture is a part of the solution. And the Danish farmers, we work 24 seven on trying to find the right solutions among the farmers together with the society. And we cannot do it ourselves. We have to do it with the society. We're looking at research development. We're looking at transferring technology and know-how. And then we have to transfer technology and know-how between countries and farmers in other in different countries. And last, but very important, we cannot do it ourselves in the agricultural sector. We have to do it together with the society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Niels. Another inspiring talk. I love that you brought up two topics that I could spend all day on. One is he touched on farms are not just about food. It's also about clean, renewable energy. And farms are about byproducts. And the more we know, the more we understand what we can capture from those byproducts and also be leaders on our circular economy. So thanks for bringing up two other additional things. I feel like I'm at a pep rally today. I'm just so excited. What a great way to start the weekend. Fred, you got to bring it home. And I know you're from Ohio, and you can do that, right? We sure, we sure can. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great day. You know, I've been to a lot of cops. And uh, I can remember the days when we had to fight our ways in to, uh, to meetings and side meetings and just talk about agriculture because it wasn't prevalently talked about. Today we have an Ag Day at COP27. That's wonderful. We are actually being recognized. And, and here we have the Secretary of Food and Agriculture from California as our moderator. This We have come a long, long way. And I don't know of any other industry that can be a bigger solution to climate change than agriculture. They can do so much. I'm a family farmer. I'm a, I farm back in Ohio in the Midwest, uh, and I raise corn, soybeans, wheat, and lots of cover crops. One of the things that's going to have to mention, and I really appreciate all the different uh, suggestions that we have of, of how we could go forward, we have to convince the farmer that these practices for climate smart agriculture are necessary to change into and, and they can also thrive and, and make profit from. And that's the key. The economic incentives that farmers will have will determine our success. We have to make it so it's profitable. We have to make it so it's practical. And we have to also be able to come up with many, many different tools in the toolbox that, that may go in different parts of the country. I'm in the Midwest. I have a lot of clay soils. But a, a farmer in Nebraska would have a lot of uh, sand. In California, you have great soils, but you have a uh, lack of water. 
in our part of the country, we actually have a problem getting rid of our water, and we have some some issues with uh, <clears throat> some off-target movement of, of some, some things we put on for fertilizer and things like that. So it's a different set of circumstances. But as long as we all concentrate and focus on the outcomes that we need, and agriculture is, is very good at figuring things out, tell us what the outcomes that are desirable, and we'll figure it out. The Solutions from the Land uh, uh, NGO is all about farmer-centric. Farmers cause are the ones that are going to have to bring it home and get this stuff done. So let's talk about the outcomes. Let's talk about how we're going to get things better. You know, one of the things that happened uh, when I started farming and bought my farms from my father, he said, all I ask your son is that you make it better than what it was. And that's what we all have to do. we got to constantly make it better than what we had when we received it. So we can, we can make things better, but we can also be a tremendous solution for climate change if we just put these tools to work that, that do this for us. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. So, oh, did you have something you wanted to add? Of course. This is a conversation. You're all free to interrupt. No, not interrupt, but ask the first question. Yes. Just to underline that it's 100% correct. The farmers cannot go green if we are in red on the bottom line on the finance balance. Thank you very much. Perfectly said, perfectly said. So I hope you're all ready with some questions or some comments that you would like to add to this conversation today. But I've, I've been listening to several themes that have come up here. Um, you talked about, about uh, the need for markets, um, those market signals so that you have the product you sell but also markets for carbon credits. Um, we heard about technical assistance. You've all have talked about science, research, and extension, um, and the need for partnerships. But I would like for you, this may not be a fair question, but I would like to hear if there were a couple of things you would like from government, from nonprofits, from the consumers that would help you on the journey of helping Egypt and the rest of the world achieve our very ambitious climate goals. What would be on your wish list? Uh, as I mentioned, I believe that uh, this solution, this lever for system change we have developed in Egypt, in our context, could work everywhere in the world. Uh, and it would be interesting to discuss later on bilaterally how it's in the US and in Denmark and in Malawi and so on. But what I can tell you now, what we need to go to 40,000, 250,000, hopefully, in the next few years to seven million farmers is to uh, really help these farmers on their way to transition. Even to issue agricultural carbon credits, you still need a transition. You start with a baseline, you need a year, you need to verify and validate and all this kind of stuff. So we are speaking about a year, or a year and a half. And when we speak about thousands of farmers, it's about capacity building, it's about investment in renewable energy, solar pumps, it's about trees, cows, uh, compost equipment, uh, 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 and even if they are small holding farmers, as they are in Egypt, when you speak about these numbers, we are speaking about investments, finance, capacity building support over this first period. The good news is all this can be repaid. It's not donation. It's not the farmers of the future will be wealthy, the farmers of the future will be honored for what they do and can have an income which makes them live a, a dignified life, but let's help them at the beginning. So this is the one part. The other thing is to make sure that this governance system, and there are many, many trials like myself in places over the world, and we have to be clear and agreeing on what is the agricultural carbon credit so that we don't enter this discussion on yours is not verified your budget. Uh, and what's the method of the soil carbon sequestration modeling? And, and there are many, many levels which need to be, in a way, uh, unified because the target is a much bigger one than just to find, search for differences. And I know that, especially in the West and in the North, there are always a lot of people who have a lot of concerns with I don't know what, and I agree, but I think we should see the upside. And last not least, because you insetting, offsetting. We need everything. We started with insetting. Our partners in Europe 
big companies with whom we trade started to take our carbon credits. Of course, it makes sense. My 2,000 farmers are small holding farmers in Aswan to Alexandria, and when they sell to a market, there is nobody who will inset anything with them. So also we need a market for them to offset. So I think there is a huge demand racing to zero. Yesterday I was in a meeting. We need three and a half billion tons. But this gives a lot of work for farmers to do. So unless we do not quick enough make this market available for all kind of farmers, small, medium, and big. Me. That was excellent. Betty, you get to go next, and then we'll go to Chandrika. Thank you. Um, I'd like to... Yeah, yeah I'd like to e emphasize the role of my um, stakeholder partnerships and how important um, it is for um, mutual accountability, inclusivity, uh, resilience building, and to make sure that there are no losers, that we are all winners. What are the trade-offs? What, what are the things that we all need to give and take in order to, ca to have this kind of partnership that is not only good for the environment, but it is good for business, and it is good for livelihoods as well. So there's a role for government to play in setting the right policy environment, the, uh, a place for NGOs and extension workers, and a place for research, which has already been um, highlighted. What about commercialization of these technologies? Getting them out of the lab onto the market and making them more accessible to users. What about the role of marketing? Because at the end of the day, um, I, I like that phrase, that we cannot go green if we're in red. And all those things, we build on that sustainable partnership and resilience that would help us to cope with the impacts and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Thank you. Thank you for that, Betty. Chandrika, did you hear our question? What are your thoughts from India? On if you had a wish list, what would you say this could really help us achieve our goals? Did you hear the question, Chandrika? Uh, hi, uh, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Niels, do I, why don't you go ahead? Okay, you could say that there were two main roads. There's the road that we have to use the sticks. We have to force the agriculture to green action. Or there's the carrots, where we support the agriculture, the farmers, to do something on their farms. Let's just say in Denmark, they are talking about a CO2 tax on all agricultural emissions, all, all greenhouse gas emissions on the farm. And the level, that's $100 per ton. And if you calculate $100 per ton, US dollar per ton, you won't have any real agricultural production. That will mean that we're going to close for the agricultural production in Denmark. This is a big, big misunderstanding. It's not the right way to go. We have to have a very, very strong agricultural and food cluster. If we have a strong agricultural and food cluster, we have innovation. We have innovation on the farms and innovation on the whole chain from the farm to the supermarket. So let's use the carrots to get the innovation on the farms, the research in the universities, and the transfer of the new technologies from the university to the farms and spread all over the world. Thank you. Chandrika, can you hear us? Do you want to weigh in on this question, please? Yes. What's on your wish list? What, what would you recommend that, OK, government, NGOs, private sector, help us, help you? Working against climate change requires Working with all stakeholders, we also need 
uh, weather insurance, uh, carbon credit for agricultures and build a uh, farmers is uh, important. Uh, have to train second generation of farmers. And strengthening of uh, farmer uh, producer organizations in uh, uh, local uh, CBOs, community based organization strengthening to need for marginalized farmers, small and marginalized farmers. Gee, thank you. Thank you, Chandrika. Fred? Uh oh. Hello? Yeah. Okay. If I have a wish list, there's probably two things that I'm thinking of. Number one is in, in enabling policy. I know in the United States we have some government policies with crop insurance and, and other ways that we can be helped, but sometimes that curtails our ability to maybe try something different. But if you have a policy that enables you to try something different, uh, that's going to really help. But the other part is probably... Uh, more practicality in the, in the private sector, and that's farmer leaders. You know, farmers learn from farmers, and so one of the things that we do on our farm is we also uh, we sell them seed, but we also sell a lot of uh, of uh, uh, precision uh, planter parts and things like that that they can learn to do that. And we've tried really hard to figure out ways that they can take their existing equipment and convert it to plant cover crops and things like that. Some of this equipment is very, very expensive, but if we can figure out how to get them to put their toe in the water and try some of these new uh, types of, of agriculture, they'll do that and they'll see and they'll build on their success. So it's really important that we have farmer leaders step up and be willing to share their stories and, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, some things work very well, but, but always you have to have trial and error. And that's how you build success by having farmers have the chance to, to, to make mistakes, but also to find new and way, better ways to do things. And if you do that, and if they can make money at it, if there's an economic uh, incentive to do it, they will do it, and they'll thrive. Make, make the business case. Love it. Love it. We have a question. Thank you so much. You could hardly wait for this, right? Thank you. I'm Tony Marr. I'm from the National Farmers Federation in Australia. I just wanted to pick up on Fred's point um, because we're preaching to the converted here a lot. I mean, a, a lot of us are here. I've been, during this session, I've been texting a farmer friend of mine in Rockhampton in North Queensland and he says to me, Tony, what are you doing there? What, you know, all this climate stuff, you know, and, and he regularly texts me. So we have a bit of banter. So Fred, how do we actually get out of talking to the converted and do what you say, get farmers to actually those that are not yet convinced and, and the business case, to, because it can be expensive to get new technology and new equipment. I know Betty talked about it as well, convincing some of her farmers. So I, I see that as we're all here having a nice chat and that's great and we should do that. But there are a lot of people that we need to convince and farm leaders I think is a really important thing. So Fred, I'd just like to hear a bit more about that. One of the things that we always encourage in my community is for every single farmer to try something different every year that makes them might feel uncomfortable but someplace in the back 40 or someplace that maybe that no one will ever even see them two things will happen either you'll you'll be very successful or you'll find out you know it didn't work and that you have to try something else or that part of the work but the, you know if you if you tweak it and make it better something will happen but you have to get farmers willing to try something new one of the hardest things that we do in, in agriculture is if you ask an older farmer, why do you do that? And he says, because that's the way we've always done it. That's not a good reason. You know, we have to have the mindset of always looking for something better and new. And one of the things that we really have to consider is instead of just thinking about growing a commodity and selling it, you have to figure out other things that you're doing with ecosystem services that you're gonna get paid for, for, for cleaner water, for cleaner air, for for uh, soil health, all these things that if you do these practices, it's going to help that. But you have to do it on a small scale first. You've got to get every one of those farmers to stick their toe in the water and try something. And I'll guarantee you, give me a farmer three to five years and I'll have him for life. Um, yeah, just to add on to that point, I think uh, in my case, I'd say there's really a place for uh, promotion of appropriate technology. Uh, and there I highlight appropriate, being able to uh, tweak things, 
to make them work in different contexts. And I cannot highlight that enough for the African context, where even within Africa, the circumstances are so different from West Africa to South Africa and, and all that. But oftentimes, the technologies that are uh, promoted, like a one size fits all, and that really discourages farmers. So we need to make, to clarify, to, to know that farmers are not a homogenous group of individuals. There are differences, and how do we work with all those different kind of farmers? And that role that research has to play is so important. The second point is, is also to highlight examples of things that are working very well. There are a lot of farmers out there who are doing excellent work whose examples would inspire other farmers. And I think we're not, we're not sharing those stories enough. We're not highlighting those successful farmers enough. And I think we need to do that. We need to have those stories told more and more. And farmers learn from each other more than they learn from anybody else. And when they see that another farmer is doing it and not going under, they will also get encouraged. So I'll just add that to the discussion. I, I, I would like to, from my perspective as an organic farmer, tell you I think we have to raise our ambition. We have to see ourselves as part of the solution. As I said, being an emitting sector, contributing, I don't know, 30% of the emissions and all this kind of stuff we hear here, we can be the one who are the carbon sinks of the future, which are needed, okay? We have to see ourselves not as reducing emissions like the industry. No, no, we are the carbon sink. We are those who sequester carbon. The only sector in the world who can sequester carbon. This is why we are climate heroes, and we need to get paid for this ecosystem service. And when we get paid for this, we will be better off than many industries in the world. From our, from our experience, from the organic farmers in Egypt, their income is 100% higher than those of their neighbors in conventional farming who don't use organic farming up till now. 100% higher, this is why from 2,000 we go to 40,000 because it's a no-brainer for a farmer. Let's share. The capacity is now the problem, not to get farmers on this. So yes, it's not only getting from red to black, it's dark black, which we aim for. Chandrika, did you want to answer that question? Do you have some thoughts on how to get more farmer leaders? I think I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Yes. I, oh, I'm sorry, Nails. I didn't mean to hop over no, you. No, no, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that we are not just here for talking about visions and... Uh, things which is not going to be reality out on the farms. It, just give you an example. When we made this vision in 2019, we were talking about being neutral in 2050. And we have been working 24-7 on solutions. One of the examples is pyrolysis. In three years ago, there was nothing going on. The farmers took contact to the industry, and now they're building installations in Denmark. Another example is feed additives. We were talking about it three years ago. Now we have it being used in Denmark on some of the farms. And the third thing is biogas. We pointed out we have to use the manure. We have to use some of the straw in the biogas, and today, 30% of all manure is going through biogas. And in three, four years, it's going to be 50%. So the farmers, they are taking action every day. And when we're here at the COP, we get new ideas. We, we share the ideas between countries, farmers, and we will bring back the ideas and use it in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to get the microphone, Ernie, back here. And while you're doing that, this is a tried and true. It actually comes out of behavior adaptation. But we used some of our early funds that we got for incentive dollars to fund initially demonstration projects as pilots so that we identify farmers who are willing to be the Fred Yoders of the world and have neighbors come to their farm and do that kind of sharing. And then they are highlighted as the lighthouse champions 
And that's a really good way of being able to do just practical extension and letting people share results, ask the questions, and really hone in on what works. And so I just think there's some age-old practices that maybe we've walked away from. And with all the new technologies, it's more important than ever. Thank you. Hi, Hi Jay Wolvogel, Dairy Farmers of America. And um, first, so impressed by your father's vision and so impressed by your continued passion. That's awesome. I want to connect a couple of things that a couple of you have said in the context of we need the carrot, we need the revenue, we need the dollars to make this make sense. And you've given some numbers on Egypt. So regenerative, organic, call it what you like. Um, you make more money and you grow to 40,000 farmers and you can envision 7 million. Absent the carbon credit, absent that source of revenue, how far can you actually get? How much will consumers pay? And I'm, I'm trying to get to the heart of how critical is it to solve the carbon credit issue? Because without that as a real revenue source, we're going to get nowhere near the targets you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, I would like then just to point to Europe. Huh? Europe is advanced in organic farming. And in an advanced market like Germany, it's 8%. What do you expect from Egypt? How many consumers will buy the more expensive organic stuff? And two cost accounting as a reality is not yet here in the minds of hearts of the consumers. So I think that the other path to reach mainstream, at least the tipping point, 20, 30 percent, will take decades. So I think we need to pay farmers for ecosystem services. And it's not only CO2, this is the hook we have at the moment. It's biodiversity, it's water holding capacity, it's social credits, cultural credits, health credits, you name them. Huh? But we have to start somewhere and we are starting now with the CO2 credits. And we need them. Without them, this model of rapid upscaling is not going to happen. That's my point, everybody sees this as the opportunity, but the, the slowness in which we define it in a way, the methodology to develop, the actual getting the markets working is never going to be fast enough to get the money to the farmers' hands to get the transition in the way that we think we need to do. That, that should be priority one, two, three, four, and five. I agree, and I'm, I'm just a hopeless optimist, and I think we will make it. <laughs> I would say not starting is, is just costing us time and money to be able to get there. Did anyone else want to respond to the question before I move on? Great. I, I would like to quote the, the more recent FAO report, and it's, it's clearly stating that food imports or cost of food is going to reach $1.4 trillion by the end of 2022. And what's concerning is we're looking at a reduction of food production of 10% by the end of this year. Like this is, this is alarming, to say the least. And we're looking at a fertilizer bill in the region of 424 billion and a, a price inflation of 112% since 2020. So look, climate change is a huge concern, but food security is an absolute must as well. So I would like the panel now to go back along and you know, how can we marry the two together to ensure we can continue, like it's very, very worrying here this morning in a room full of farmers, when we're hearing that food production is dropping 10% in the world, when we know that people this morning cannot have a breakfast. So I would like to know how we can bring the two along together. Thank you very much. Now to start, I think there are reports, several reports all over the world, which prove that by organic farming, we can feed 15 billion people, not six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. The question of feeding people is not only related to producing more on a piece of land, which I also agree to and we work on every day, but we have no theoretical problem of feeding the world. It's a social problem. It's many, many interrelated things. But by going to regenerative agricultural practice, you, would, uh, you work on adaptation to climate change, you work on mitigation of climate change, you work on healthy food, and at the same time you do something which I think has to do with the social uh, conditions of rural development because in Egypt our youth <laughs> they want to run away to cities uh, and not stay at the farm because it's so boring and they have no income and there's uh, there's nothing so all this together can only be solved of course by holistic approach but it's not that we are in danger when we go to organic which I often hear that we then cannot feed the world no we can feed the world organically 
but we have to work on it on all the levels, of course. Um, I, I would also like, can you hear me? Um, I, I would also like to bring in the angle of food waste uh, and the role that uh, that has to play in ensuring that uh, there's uh, improved food security. At the moment, we still have a lot of food waste. And one of the examples that, that I gave in another session is how as consumers, they, the consumer tests and demands are also contributing to a lot of food waste, food waste particularly at the farm, where uh, a lot of the product remains unsold. We have 30 to 40% food waste happening on the farm. That is food that should have gone on the market, but it's otherwise wasted and not able to find its, its place, um, find itself in, in, in supermarkets or in people's homes just for things that can be easily managed. So it's not just about the production, but also how we're managing what we are producing. Thank you. I fully agree with your point. We have to have focus on producing food to a growing population in the world. And as I said in my introduction, we have to produce more with less. In fact, we have to produce more agricultural products for the growing population on a smaller area than we do today. Because there's also other challenges, for example, with uh, biodiversity. So in the future, let's have focus on being very, very efficient being very efficient in the organic area and being very efficient in the traditional area. Let's don't start a discussion about should we do it organic or should we do it traditional. There's a market for both products and we have to produce both products and put them on the market and secure that we produce and put the, mark, put the products on the market without a lot of food loss on the way. That's we're very good at that in Europe, very good at that in the United States, but other parts of the world, as Africa, there's a very, very huge problem with loss of food from the farm to the market. So let's work together and try to find the solutions and bring the solutions from one country to another. Real briefly, Karen, you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's really important. You know, in this past couple of years when we had the COVID uh, outbreak and fertilizer prices went way high and, and any, uh, everything went high, our, our whole infrastructure was not designed for, for gaps like this. But we've been able to, to come up with other solutions like for fertilizer. We have to think of this as a, as a circular economy. And that's, that's going to be a key word that you think about. So you can reutilize the, the manure from, from uh, livestock production or if we're producing biogas, you know, with, with biochar or else the, the, uh, the stuff you have after you're done with it, it, that is, it, it, use that as a soil amendment. There's lots of substitutes we can have. I mean, <clears throat> you've heard the, the saying that we can actually use everything but the, but the squeal of an animal that, to, to go back into a row crop. So we really have to concentrate on finding alternative ways to do that instead of we got to get out of the mindset that, that we have to rely on things that are mined and, 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 and we use uh, resources that are never coming back. We can make and get value from the resources that we currently have, but just recycle them through there. And I think a, a circular economy is going to be a, a very big part of our future. Thank you. I would love to keep doing this for at least another hour, but Ernie's already told me to cut this off. Chandrika, thank you so much for joining us virtually today, and good luck to you and to your farmers this year. Helme, Betty, Niels, and Fred, great way to start Ag Day at COP27. Please join me in thanking them.